My wife and I have made $4 million in sponsorships in, you know, in the last decade plus. How do you then catalog your value as a creator? Back in the day, brands were not really paying influencers, creators. And then there's a special way, right, to intrigue these brands, I'm guessing, right, to cause curiosity, mm -hmm. build a relationship, and also find out exactly what is it, what they want. So can you dive a little bit deeper into that? Clarifying, no golden speedo. <laughs> <laughs> no, joke. I mean, you can't really see. I, I, you don't know what I'm wearing below, there we below go. from the waist down. Yeah. I mean, Jesse, anything else you want to add before we head out? You can do this. Like sponsorships, I believe, is for everyone. It doesn't matter how, what size you are, what niche you're in. It doesn't matter if you've never done it before. You can actually make a lot of money doing this. Serving education at the end of the day. I mean, nobody knows your content better than you. That's the other thing, right? And it's also, you know, trusting yourself. I think the biggest myth is that... We've got some hey, fresh, I'm new Luis. And I'm Luis. You and you're listening before. to the Content One, is Profit two, three, podcast. Listen. Right. Good job. We got all of them. All uh, of them. I, we got, <laughs> we got the I, I, think, I think we forgot the money one on this one. So I'm like, ka-ching, <laughs> ka-ching, 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 ka-ching. Uh, anyways, guys, if you're enjoying this show, the latest episodes have been really packed with really good information. Go ahead and follow the show in your favorite podcasting platform. Uh, we're bringing some uh, some friends of the network. That it's is right. That is right. And if today's guest helped you move one step closer towards your goal, please don't forget to share this episode. And, of course, don't forget to leave a five-star review. That's right. So, guys, we are back officially. Episode 456. Let's go. I've been saying, like, we're close to 500 for almost 50 episodes now. <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> probably one of the first times we talked about sponsorships. That is right. And magically for us, today's <laughs> guest is the creator wizard himself, the godfather of sponsorships. Someone who has done over 4 million macaroos <laughs> in sponsorships and sent over 550 sponsorship invoices for his own personal business. I just imagined like the email going to uh, invoice, 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 invoice. Let's I know. Go. Ka -ching, ka -ching, ka -ching, ka -ching. <laughs> Not to mention that he's as cool as they come. He used to be in a metalcore band, classically trained in opera, and of course, hosts a podcast and is an awesome dad. Let's go. We might or might not ask him to sing on this podcast, <laughs> but. Please welcome the Pavarotti of content creators, the creator wisdom himself, Justin Moore. What's up, Justin? What is going on, guys? That was probably the best intro. Uh, I need you guys to. I need you guys to follow me around when, like, go speak on stages or something. You guys are like the best hype people. You know, I was really itching during the intro because you guys were like, "Oh, we don't have the money thing." I got the money. Sound Let's effects. go. We I'm got the money I'm, thing. I'm showing up. I'm ready for this. And <laughs> if your jokes and it, and if your jokes are not funny, I've got some. I've got some other sound effects. Yes. There we go. There we go. All right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> approved. Approved by the kiddos. Yeah. The feel, feel free to use them. Feel free to use them, please. And. Uh, right, consider it right. done we can definitely follow you around you know we got some confetti thingies and explode and just you know just hype you up whatever you go yep t-shirt cannon t-shirt gun maybe yeah. maybe something like that <laughs> yeah i like it i like it we need some like some wands i actually saw a product of like this wand that you like actually like shoot little papers on fire it was pretty cool probably oh, yeah. a hazard a hazard but here in the studio still yeah, good. For, <laughs> for the house maybe if you convince katie yep. but uh, but yeah, yeah. No, no. Justin, welcome to Content Profit. We're so excited to have you, man. I've been following your content for a little bit. Uh, we know that you're really good friends with Jay Klaus from the HubSpot Podcast Network. And honestly, after I saw one of your, it was your podcast episode at first, right? It, it was recommended to us by Carly from the network. And you started appearing everywhere. <laughs> but I'm not going to lie. The thing <laughs> that hooked me was your hooks. Your hooks were absolutely incredible. And that helped me start and dive into your ecosystem. And then I found out that you were actually the sponsorship guy and all these things. So first of all, I'm a little bit curious. You say you started as a creator in 2009. Seven years ago, you became a full-time creator. What transition there? What was that change? Because from 2009 to seven years ago, I'm not going to do the math right here, <laughs> you know. But, you know, that's quite a while that it sounds like you stay persistent and consistent working on your content to be able to do that transition. 
Yeah, so it's actually been almost 10 years that I've been doing it full-time, actually. Wow. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, even even longer. And my wife has been doing it uh, full-time for 12 years. And actually, I give for, full credit to her because she was actually the one who started her channel, uh, initially her YouTube channel early on. But back in the day, I was in medical devices. I'm actually an engineer by, oh, by wow. background. Um, and it was actually my wife who started tinkering with uploading videos on YouTube way back in, in 2009. And I was kind of uh, behind the scenes. I wasn't in front of the camera, but she had kind of tap tap me to ask for help when brands started coming and yeah. knocking on her door because initially she had a kind of beauty and cosmetics channel where she was talking about makeup and beauty products, hair care, that kind of thing. Mm. Um, and back in the day, um, brands were not really paying influencers, creators. It was like, Hey, yeah. here's this free, you know, like hair curler or like blow dryer or something. And she was like, yes, this is amazing. <laughs> it's like, you know, cause we were like, we were super, yeah. you know, like, like we were young, we didn't have a ton of money. And so like, free <laughs> stuff was, was amazing. Right. And so it was when that first brand offered to compensate her. That mm -hmm. was when we were like, Whoa, hold on a second here. This is crazy. Like they are offering to actually pay her money to talk about their brand on her channel. And so that's when I, I was like, by this time I was like, uh, getting my MBA at night. And so I was like, Mr. MBA, I can read this contract. Let me help negotiate this. And I, was, I have no idea, no idea what we were doing. Right. Um, and, and not only did we not have any idea what we were doing, but no one in our life, our friends, our family, we didn't know anyone else who were, who was really doing this, um, yeah. you know, back, you know, this was 2009 or by this time, probably 2010, 2011. Um, and so we just bumbled our way through it guys. Like we made every mistake in the book. Um, you know, we, Oh, a hundred bucks. Yeah. That sounds like a good amount. You know, 200, yeah. 500 bucks. Yeah, sure. It sounds good. Right. Uh, sign away broadcast TV rights. Like literally this happened. We, we turned on the TV <laughs> one day and we saw my wife was in a commercial, like a TV commercial. And we were like, we like looked at each other. Like, did we grant the brand the rights to do that? Looked at the contract. <laughs> sure enough. You know, and this wow. was for free stuff. This is not even for money. Right. And so, yeah. Honestly, like this is, this is really, we, we learned everything trial by fire, just like making every mistake in the book. Um, you know, we, we ultimately started getting a lot more experience and started, you know, uh, understand how to like, you know, value what we were bringing to the table when we were working, collaborating with these brands. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, as you mentioned, you know, have done, you know, hundreds and hundreds of deals to date, but I also, um, back in 2015, uh, decided to start an influencer marketing agency. And this is really where a lot of my perspective comes from, uh, when I educate creators, because, um, I started getting in the rooms, in the boardrooms with these big brands and these big advertisers and helping them decide how to allocate, not just let's say 5k or 10, K to a creator, but now it's like a million dollars or 500 K across, you know, 50 yeah. creators or a hundred creators. What's the platform strategy, like all this stuff. And so, um, I really started getting this perspective also interacting with all of these influencers and creators and messaging yeah. them and say, Hey, this brand over here wants to work with you and seeing so much just unprofessionalism and lack of communication and like mm -hmm. just, just a lot of mistakes being made. And so, um, these are the two kind of Jekyll and Hyde's of my personality. I've been a creator in the yeah. trenches for many years, but also have been in, um, you know, running and ran an agency for many years. And so this is, we can talk about the the education stuff, but like, this is, this is really what my perspective comes from is, yeah. uh, is seeing all the mistakes that were yeah. being made. Very, very interesting. I feel like you're, uh, one of those unique specimens that have the business skills, you know, to negotiate, but at the same time, you are extremely creative and you can do all that side as well on the creative side of things, which is, I feel is a rare site. You don't really come across many creators that are extremely passionate about the business mm -hmm. side of things. Yeah, and I'm really handsome and humble. So it's like, That's perfect. You know, you know. There we go. There the we perfect go. Perfect trifecta. Yeah. Perfect trifecta. <laughs> I can only imagine your wife in the yes. That's right. That's the man I married. You know, I, man, I, just, I pray for days where I can have this confidence. Right I, here, I just man. get a. I just get a. There we go. I just get a big eye roll from Katie. You know, every time I say that, you know, she keeps saying, "But you are not Ooh. funny." Well, guess what, Katie? We're laughing here. You know. <laughs> but uh, you see, I'm. I mean, that, that's. A, that's an incredible story, right? And for a lot of people, you know, in, in our studio, they come in, right? And the first thing that they ask, obviously, as uh, they're interested to produce a podcast and they're asking these questions is like, you know, how do how do we monetize, right? And obviously on our side, we are, for, you know, our business, it, the core business is a production agency. We have a fractional content team that comes in. So immediately our podcast, when we launched it, was directly related to that. We're like, we're actually going to talk to the decision makers. We're going to create content around that. But at the same time, it's a direct line to that conversation that, 
can bring an opportunity, right? But yep. then, you know, we have a huge variety of shows that come here and they might not be a fit for a business conversation on the back end, for example, right? They might not be an interview show or a conversation show and it can be very, very intimidating, right? So like a cool a cool case study that we have here is like this uh, religious podcast uh, from, from Dennis, right? And he set it up as a non-profit organization. He, he went out uh, after his friends in the church and the church is financing the whole podcast and, and this whole thing kind of continues to, to grow and grow. It's very exciting, but for him it was like a very specific thing and before him, I honestly had no idea. We've never dealt with sponsorships uh, before the network came along. And even with the network, we don't have those conversations. So what are, like, uh, to diminish that overwhelm that a lot of creators might have initially, right? It's like, uh, what are the first steps, the first three steps that people can start looking into when tackling things like this? Yeah, so I think the biggest myth is that the, the primary thing that brands or companies care about are, is your reach mm -hmm. or your listeners or your download numbers or whatever. This is what most people fixate are fixated on. It's probably the most common question I get is like, how many subscribers, how many yeah. followers, how many listeners do I need to be able to like start reaching out to a brand? Um, and I'll, say, I'll, I'll just say right out the gate, this is BS. Like there are a lot of brands that, yes, there are some brands that care about that. Um, if that's what you're leading with, if you say, oh, I get 10,000, you know, listens per episode or here's my demographics yeah, yeah. or blah, blah, blah. Um, then you're basically leading the witness. You're saying, mm -hmm. okay, Please commodify me, brand. <laughs> I'm just like every other creator, every other yeah. podcaster that reaches out. All you should care about is my is my listenership. And so what I teach creators is that don't lead with that because there's a lot of other, uh, there's, there's three, basically three campaign goal types that brands care about when they collaborate with a brand. The first one is actually awareness, right? So the primary reason that they want to collaborate with you is just to spread the word. Maybe it's a new product launch. Maybe they're launching in a new territory. They were previously only in the UK. Now they're in the US. Um, and yeah. then the next campaign goal type is what I call repurposing. So the primary reason that a brand wants to collaborate with you is because they want to take your content and use it in other ways. Mm -hmm. They want to embed it on their website. They want to put it on an e-commerce platform. They want to run paid advertising with it. And then the final campaign goal type is conversion, right? Where it's mm -hmm. driving, you know, sales or app downloads or trial signups for a software program or whatever. Um, and so it's so important to understand what the brand is trying to accomplish um, because if you're leading the witness by saying views, you know, downloads, like, you know, here's my demographics, like then you're, you're telling the brand, okay, well, this is what you should care about. When in reality, the brand's going to get this pitch inbound from you. And they're like, wait, hold on a second here. We it's actually don't care about that yeah. right now. Yeah. It's not in alignment with what we, with what we're trying to accomplish. And so um, this is the first place. This is, I put my hand on people's shoulders and be like, look, you have to understand this because if you, um, your pitches are going to fall on deaf ears unless you, uh, you can speak their language. Yeah. Yeah. Something I heard you talk about was pretty much taking the role of a consultant when you're talking to these brands, right? And I feel, again, we personally don't have that much experience be besides our experience with HubSpot, but I feel like it's a space where a lot of people are very passive, right? They are just kind of like waiting for brands to reach out to them, to notice them, which I feel like it's going to be extremely difficult, right? At that point, you already need to be very, very big. So there's definitely need to be some sort of proactiveness into reaching out. And then there's a special way, right, to intrigue these brands, I'm guessing, right, to cause curiosity, mm -hmm. build a relationship, and also find out exactly what is it, what they want. So can you dive a little bit deeper into that? Because I think it's going to be extremely helpful for, especially for people that might not have big followings and like you just mentioned right now right you don't need followers to get a sponsorship yeah so what i like to talk about is what i call a sponsorship continuum meaning that what you pitch to a brand or a company has to change based on where you're at in your creator journey mm. so if you are in the very beginning and you're still trying to find your footing and try to understand maybe you're only getting a couple hundred downloads on your podcast or views on your videos or whatever. If you were to reach out and pitch a brand, um, Hey, let me talk about you on my podcast or let me talk about you on my YouTube channel or something. That's mm -hmm. likely not going to move the needle for them, right? Yeah. Because your footprint, your viewership is not very large. And so the thrust of your pitch should probably be something more like, Hey, I audited your social presence. 
And I think there's a lot of other ways in which we could be telling your brand story in a more compelling way. Let me make some content for you. And hey, go take a look at my podcast or my YouTube channel because that is my portfolio. Yeah. So it's not, hey, let me let me talk about you on my platform. And, and so that this is the very beginning of the continuum. And then, yes, let's say that you do start growing and you are starting to get, let's say, thousands of views or listens on your podcast or your YouTube channel. Yeah, maybe now the pitch is more of like a hybrid where I'm going to make some content for you. I'm going to talk. Yeah, I am going to talk about you on my platform now because it's beginning to be more meaningful. Yeah. And then now, OK, you do achieve some scale now. You're getting tens of thousands of views or listens or whatever. Yeah, maybe now it's very meaningful to talk about a brand exclusively on your platform. And so this is what I like to this is I like to talk about this continuum because it gives people the permission to realize like, oh, I actually don't need to wait mm. until I get 10,000 followers or 10,000, you know, average downloads. It's like, I can actually provide a lot of value to a brand today. Let me go out and pitch them now. Yeah. yeah. So how do you find who to pitch? Like usually what are the people in the roles of the decision makers? Because I feel like there could be a little bit of confusion there. They might go for, I don't know, CMO. Obviously it depends on the, how big a company is that you want to talk about. But for example, when you were kind of like working on the agency and you were that liaison between the influencers and the big companies, who, who were you mainly talking to? Okay, so we can talk about that, but can I take a step back here? Because 100%. this is a big mistake I think a lot of people make, which is they, they say, okay, I'm going to go out there, I'm going to pitch some sponsors, and I'm going to go after the brands that I already love and use, mm. right? I'm going to go, I'm going to go pitch, you know, uh, you know, Transistor or Castos mm. or whatever, whatever podcast platform I use. That's perfect. I talk about podcasts a lot on my, on content is profit. I'm going to go pitch that, right? And so it's like, th this yeah. is what most people think about is the, the shoe in sponsors mm. yeah. um, and the exercise that all creators need to need to do when they're trying to figure out who would be the perfect sponsor for them is what I call an audience first offer survey. Okay. And what this is, is actually a psychographic survey that you send out to your audience um, where you ask them the following questions. You say, Hey, I want to learn more about you audience. Yeah. I have the demographics of whatever platform I on, but I want to know more. I want to get some yeah. more colorful texture about who you are. I want to understand you know, what are your jobs? Are you married? Do you have kids? Uh, you know, how are you interacting with my content? Are you in line at Starbucks, you know, you know, scrolling, you know, my feed for two minutes? Or are you sitting down every Sunday and binging three hours of my content, catching up on it? Um, what products and services do you wish that I offered that I don't? Mm -hmm. What brands and products and services are you using and loving right now? Are there other creators or peers in our industry that you'd love to see me collaborate with? And why? Right. And so when you start asking this information, you get some really interesting um, insights here. The first one yeah. is, you know, brands and products and services. Oh, wow. My my people are saying that they want this course for me or this newsletter for me or this other thing that they would actually pay for. Number one, that's interesting. So your own products, right? Direct monetization. Then the sponsor thing is like, oh, I actually didn't realize there was this cohort of my audience that is already using this you know, tool over here that's totally yeah, yeah. unrelated to my content. But so, so for example, you guys work with like a lot of, you know, creators, small business owners, people who are trying to make a name for themselves with content. Like what, what happens if you send that survey out to your audience and people are like, oh man, I'm really struggling with, you know, bookkeeping or, mm. or keeping my, you know, understanding if I need to incorporate or understanding, you know, uh, how I can, uh, you know, uh, expense stuff around tax yep. time. Like that's not an, a super obvious yeah. like sponsor for you guys, but you're like, Oh wait, like, uh, uh, you know, 50% of my, of our respondents says that they're having a problem with this. Let, let, let's go out and pitch, you know, QuickBooks or FreshBooks or something mm, yeah. and say, Hey, this is the persona of our audience. I actually would, we'd love to expose our full audience to your, your solution. Yeah. Right. And so, so this is the sponsor thing. And then the, that last thing is what I call alliances. Right. So it's like, there's other people in the industry of products that they offer coaching courses, this type of thing that you guys are never going to offer. Right. But it actually serves your audience. And so yeah. this whole kind of audience first offers mindset is so critical because now you have a holistic picture of how you can actually serve your audience. And so this is this is the best way to figure out what types of sponsors to pitch because it's not about you. It's yeah. about your audience. I uh, I'm in awe and I love this because I remember being in a conference and there was a, a speaker on stage once and uh, they built this incredible company mainly for women and uh, their entire product offering 
their one rule was we have to ask our audience first before we actually go develop the thing. And uh, I think they sold for a hundred million after you know a few years of, of executing this, but they were like, if our audience is not asking for it, we're not gonna build it or create it or whatever. And, uh, and it was a light bulb moment for me at that point. We are like, well, it actually makes so much sense, right? Uh, trying to push this thing that maybe, you know, because you know we're in the weeds or we're creating it or we experience it every single day doesn't mean that the people that might listen to our message might be having that same problem you know and it like you said like it's same with the business but also uh you don't have to do it right there's all the companies that you can uh tag team this and uh and put it together so i i love this uh, it's a similar approach and now in my head everything is kind of yeah. coming together right it's like basically you know it's what hospital is doing you know with us the community the people that we help right they obviously are a tech company and and they want their message to be heard and hopefully provide a solution for for the people that are listening and interacting with with us yeah. um now following on that right like let's say you do your survey you identify the problems you're like perfect like i have this list of people that i can reach out to how do you then uh catalog your value as a creator right because mm -hmm. obviously a lot of people mm -hmm. like their first thing is like well i if they want to go full-time creator like i want to make a living out of this right obviously you know you might have your own bills your own thing your own targets on on how much uh do you need every single month every single year but also as a business right how do you how do you then value that right and then have that conversation with maybe brands that might be more experienced than you at that point of having these conversations yeah so um Fonzie, I am going to get back to your question around how do you, who do you reach out to? It's okay, and stuff like that. It's, I promise, it's okay, I promise. If, you, if, it's okay um, if you don't, we can just ignore Fonzie. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let me, let me just, let me just use yeah. the sound. Yes. 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 No, thank you, Justin. I will be clipping this and sending it to his wife. That's it. <laughs> okay. 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 So, um, I have a really simple um, uh, exercise uh, about this to kind of give yourself permission to real to take the pressure off, um, because it's not about you. Hmm. That's that's what I want everyone to hear. It's not about you when it comes to reaching out and pitching a brand. A lot of people get into this imposter syndrome state because they think, "Oh, I have to do this dog and pony show to convince a brand or a company that I'm worthy." of their, you know, collaboration or their money or whatever. And it has nothing to do with you. It has, you know what it has everything to do with? Helping the brand accomplish their business objectives. Mm. That's it. And so your task now becomes, instead of doing the dog and pony show, is research. What are they posting on social media? What does it seem like is important to them? Go and look up their VP of marketing or the people on their marketing uh, you know, team on LinkedIn. What are they posting on LinkedIn? What kind of press releases are they sending out? Let's go look at their job board and see what types of positions they're recruiting for. Oh, they're looking for a social media manager or a content marketing person. That's interesting. Let me look at what they're looking for that person to do. Yeah. And then you use that to develop this colorful pic picture of what it seems like they're trying to accomplish in 2024 or 2025 or whatever it is. And so when you reach out to them and say, hey, I would love to collaborate with you, uh, instead of saying like, oh, my name is Justin, I get this many you know, views on my videos or listens on my podcast, I've got this demographics. That's an instant delete <laughs> on that email because the brand doesn't know who you, who you are. They don't yeah. care. Yeah. Uh, they just ghosted you or rejected you. But if you instead say, hey, I saw that you are trying to, you know, spread awareness of this new feature on your product uh, based on this, you know, uh, fireside chat that I saw your, heard your VP of marketing talking about at South by Southwest. I also am talking about that with my audience. Here's a yeah. link to like, you know, exactly where I, I illustrate that my audience has affinity for this goal that you have. I would love to help spread the word about this in the mm. following ways. I can do 10 podcast ad reads. I can do some TikToks. I can do some YouTube videos. I can give you the rights to repurpose that content for three months. Are you free on Thursday at 10 a.m. to talk about it? <laughs> right. And so yeah. it's no longer about you. It's about mm -hmm. saying, hey, I saw that you're trying to do this. It's a, it's a positioning mm -hmm. exercise. You have this problem brand sponsoring me will help you solve that problem. So it's this real unlock for a lot of people when they realize that, wow, I, it's actually very easy to illustrate the value that I can have. Because the other, the other brilliant thing about this is that brands and companies don't have buckets of piles of money laying around to pay and sponsor random creators or influencers that reach out. You know what they do have money for? their own initiatives. They have budgets <laughs> for their own initiatives. So yeah. that that's the whole unlock here is like realizing that it's not complicated. You just have to do a little bit of sleuthing. 
Yeah, that. I'm sorry. I think you can answer my, my question in there as well by, you know, going and searching for the VPs, like what are some of the positions that they're looking for and <laughs> whatnot. Um, but just to confirm, well, are those well, mainly the people you, you well, kind of like search to talk to? So yes and no. So the titles change depending on the scale of the yeah. organization, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, if it's a, if it's a small mom and pop shop and there's 10 employees there, you look it up on LinkedIn, there's probably only going to be one marketing person yeah. at, at that company, the head of marketing or the director of marketing. That's probably the person doing all the things, mm -hmm. but as a company gets larger, Yeah. Then they start to, uh, you know, develop different, uh, you know, uh, competencies within yeah. compartmentalizing their siloed across different departments. So, yeah, like mo a lot of especially consumer brands and even B2B companies now have influencer marketing managers or partnership marketing managers. Right. Um, and so those are the types of titles that you'd want to target. But then once you get very large and you get to a certain level of scale, now the company probably hires an agency, a PR agency, maybe even an, a media agency, influencer marketing agency to handle a lot of these types of activations, yeah. especially if it's a <clears throat> large part of their marketing strategy. And so, yeah, it, it does definitely change uh, depending on the scale of the organization, but that's yeah. kind of how I think about it. Yeah. yeah. So I, I heard you talk about um, kind of like a hybrid model, right? Of that that being your favorite, meaning the company pays you some sort of base comp compensation, right? For the work that you're putting in, as well as maybe some affiliate deals, you know, through the conversions that you might be getting for that brand. Now, I want to add this to this question. I have this hypothesis, right? For a while. And I think you're the perfect, person to throw it out there, kind of like spaghetti to a wall, see if it sticks, you know? <laughs> All right. I, I, I called it the growth partnership. Um, well, actually, I got to work on the name, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> I, thought, I, thought, I, thought, I, I thought I had a third, a third word in there. It. Let's workshop but, it. But the, the, yeah, let's <laughs> workshop on that. But the hypothesis pretty much, and this came actually when we were at Podcast Movement, right? Mm -hmm. And we saw a lot of brands out there and we saw a lot of people talking and I was like, you know what, for somebody that might not have a big social media audience, but we want to grow that audience, right? We can, there's obviously multiple ways, collaborations, but we also want to get sponsorships. So is there mm -hmm. a way to potentially get them, you know, sell them on the awareness, get them to pay for the ad budget in a sense, right? And then it's a win-win situation because we're creating content for them, putting money behind it to reach new audiences. And those new audiences are, you know, getting awareness on the brand and then following as well us as creators. And hopefully on that, we get a cut maybe for, you know, that base payment that, that you could say. And, and when you talked about the hybrid model, my mind went to this idea that I had a while back. Have you seen anything like that done before? Maybe there's a better way, right, that you've experienced throughout your years. I mean, I think that it, every brand is different. Like every brand is going to get excited. Like, you know, I, I've seen this. I can't even tell you how many times I've seen this where <laughs> the CEO of a company will just decide uh, that, hey, content marketing, influencer marketing, we have to do this. Mm. They, they, they went to inbound or they went to podcast movement or they went to some industry trade yeah. show yeah. and they heard someone speak about how important content is, how content is profit. Right. <laughs> and they were like, and they said, we need to do this. And so yeah. they, they arrive back at the office and they send out a mandate to their marketing team that like, Hey, this is a thing we need to do now. Mm. And so, um, like at that point, um, you know, Like, it just depends on, like, what the priorities are for the organization uh, at any given time. And yeah. so um, what, I, what I say is that, yeah, it could probably work for the right brand or the right company at the right time if it's a priority for the organization. But you're not going to know that until you start yeah. becoming a detective. So when you start doing the research and you see what, what's going on, you hear them speak or you hear something um, and then when you get your foot in the door and you're on an initial discovery call with that company and you start asking these questions, what's your content strategy brand? What's your, you know, partnership or influencer strategy? What's your, right. And you just kind of start pulling this thread rather than sitting up there and talking about you and having it be this big ego stroke. You, yeah. you check that at the door and you say, tell me like, let's let make this a discovery. You, you tell me everything that I need to know. And then your solution is going to be bespoke 
for every brand. So one brand that you have a call with may say, oh, we just want to be featured on your podcast. Yeah, we, we just want that awareness. Another brand may say, oh, we, we have no idea what our what we're doing. We really want an, our podcast for ourselves, for our business. We want to do this. We want yeah. to stand up our YouTube channel. We want to do this. Can you do that too? Um, they may not even want to be featured as a, on your podcast, yeah. right? Because yeah. that because that's not their goal. And so I really try to pound this into people's mm. heads that it's not about you. It's not about just like, oh yeah, I'm going to put this into my like invent my ad inventory. Yeah. No, it's like you have to serve the brand depending on what their goals are, because that's how you're going to make so much more money. Yeah. <laughs> this is how yeah. you're going to make 10 times the amount of money on your sponsorship strategy. When you stop thinking about it as, as just inventory. Mm. Yeah. I love it. I, I, I like that point of view. I love that you keep coming back to that. It's kind of that principle, right? It's not about you. It's about them. This is step number one, right? Immediately my mind went kind of to this thought process of, well, what if you create this playbook or different type of playbooks that you could present to organizations depending on the type of problems that they have and they're considering, right? So if they have, if you talk to somebody, you know, you take the role of a detective and they do say, well, we do have an awareness challenge and, you know, we're looking for people, <coughs> spread awareness, we have a budget. You're like, oh, cool. Then here is the growth partnership model. All right, we'll work on that, <laughs> right? And then you're like, hey, look, maybe that is an option, you know, that we can do. But now you are tying that solution after being the detective first. I like that. 100% because, and this is what will happen is that you will start developing this private repository of proposals that you just kind of cut and paste the right slides depending on what the brand's problem is, right? And so rather than sending out a partnership deck that's like this boilerplate media kit or whatever, like, here you go. This is like how we work with every brand. Yeah. Pick, pick option A, B, C, D, E. No, it's like, here's, this is the customized solution based on what you told me. Like uh, one thing I talk about in my, in my brand deal wizard program is like developing these proposals where the first slide is what we heard. Mm. These are the goals that you said you have goal one, goal two, goal three, goal four. And you go through the proposal and you're literally tying everything that you're proposing to their goals. So they said, Oh, you said awareness or content marketing is your goal. Well, package one, that's going to be the package that you want to pick if that's the goal that you want to accomplish. Mm, yep. And because now rather than being like, which sponsorship package do you want to pick? It's, Hey, pick this specific one so that you can, but you know, by the end of this, you're going to accomplish that goal because remember they have to go, they have, they're accountable to their, you know, superiors or their boss or their client, if it's an agency. And yeah. so if they can bring this proposal back to them and say, Hey, this, this, you know, uh, Luis and Fonzie are saying that if we pay them $50,000 or $25,000, we're going to accomplish this goal. We have, you're going to instantly stand out from all these other people that they're talking to, because none of those people are making those promises or yeah, those yeah. guarantees or those tying that. And, and th again, it's like, it's so, so important to help them you know, realize that um, these sponsorship do dollars are not going to be the, the other thing too. Sorry, I'm going all these rabbit holes, but like, I love well, it. I love it. <laughs> what, what are the, what, what are their alternatives to influencer marketing? This is what they're thinking is like, okay, we could spend 50 K here or yeah. we could go spend 50 K on Facebook ads. And we know that, you know, if we spend, you know, 10 K on Facebook ads, we know that the return on ad spend to that for the last five years has been two or three X something, right? We, we know that, right? Yeah. And so they're thinking about the same thing here. They're thinking, okay, well, why should we spend 25 or 50K on this partnership here? We don't have that same level of certainty yeah. with that spend. And so your goal should be helping them understand, no, no, you actually do have that certainty here. It's different because there's content at play. That's not free. Like there, there's a lot of different aspects here, yeah. but like you can have the same level of, of goal certainty, um, you know, through, through partnerships. Yeah. Yeah. I, cool. I, I love that at the base of everything is serving, right? At the end of the yeah. day, serving education at the end of the day. I mean, nobody knows your content better than you. That's the other thing, right? Like sometimes, you know, as creators, you're creating your, your thing, you've done it for, for a bunch of time. You know, the people that follow you, you have these conversations every single day. And it's also, you know, trusting yourself that, that you know that, that you can actually go ahead and, and have yeah. that conversation. And then when the focus shifts on like, actually, here's how we can help you with your specific problems. I love it. I mean, the, the, for, for us personally on the business side, everything changed once we started listening to that, right? Like before the, the content fractional team agency that 
that we started, we had seven different things, right? And we like, you know, undo this and do that. And and I think going back, as you were explaining it, that was like a similar process that we did, right? We have these very customizable offers uh, as an agency or a service or freelancers at the time, right? And then they'll be like, okay, this is the specific one for you. And then we're like, oh, we charge way too little for that. And then the next <laughs> time we'll be like, okay, we raise the price, right? And then we did it again. And then we did it again. And then out of the seven options, we we landed in like the one that most people were like after, right? And then that evolved into the different things. So I'm going through my head this process. Sponsorship is very similar at the end of the day, right? And uh, and it focus on serving that client or partner or brand that you that you're talking to. I I love this. It, in my head, is simplifying the process, and I'm hoping by walking through this, a lot of people listening today are going through the same process if they have a business or if they have a, a pro or a situation that they've done similar things. And at the end of the day, it's like, what's in it for them, right? It's just like the content. It's like, is my hook, what's in it for them? In my content, what's in it for them? Are we providing a win for them? Are they, you know, moving to the next step? I freaking love this. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Justin, I, I do want to do a little transition here. I love everything. We've talked about yeah. sponsorships, right? I mean, the, the biggest myth companies, you know, uh, that is, in reality, not all brands just care about the followers and all that stuff. Right, the three types of you had a specific name for this kind of like gold content awareness that they embedded the com the conversion the sponsorship continuum that was pretty good how to figure out who be your perfect sponsor right psychographic survey audience first offer mindset lots of lots of gold but like I mentioned at the very beginning one of the things that really caught my attention about you was your hooks man you are good your hooks are amazing. And, you know, something that I've learned from Ali Abdal was he says he spends an asymmetric amount of effort throughout the production of his content, meaning the parts that usually get the most views is going to invest the most effort in, which is usually the first couple of seconds, right? And the title, the thumbnail, the first 30 seconds, one minute, the hook. And let me tell you, I can tell nowadays who are going to be the creators. As soon as I start watching their, their latest, you know, content, I'm like, this creator is going to keep rising through the ranks because of their hook and the amount of effort and intention that they put into the beginning of their videos. You are one of those, my friend. And I'm excited to learn Appreciate more it. about, do you have a process on how do you create these hooks, right? How, maybe what are some takeaways that people that are listening to this today can add that to their repertoire of content creation arsenal, right? And then, it also gonna help them when they get to pitch a sponsor, right? When they get to have that conversation, they're gonna go and look at their content. They're gonna see, well, they got better hooks. They got really hooks, which is gonna help them overall, right? With their retention and getting discovered and all that stuff. So what are maybe some key takeaways in there? All right, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, okay, I got two things to talk about here. The first one um, is that I script everything. Like I have a, not my, so I like when I do live streams and stuff like that, obviously I can't script that, but like all of my long form content, all my short form content, I heavily script it because, um, like I think that it's, it's, I know myself and I sit, if I sit down in front of a camera, I'm just going to start rambling and I'm not, uh, you know, I, I want to eliminate as much fluff as possible. And yeah. I want to make sure that I'm able to deliver the message that I'm able to, um, in the shortest amount of time. Um, and, and just pro again, provide value for, uh, as quickly as possible for the people who are going to click on that YouTube video or that yeah. TikTok or whatever it is. And so scripting to me, a lot of people I know are not like right now I'm looking straight into a teleprompter right now. I have a teleprompter with my, my camera. And so I'm looking directly at you guys. I'm not looking like slightly below my screen. Yeah, and so when I have the teleprompter, I, I have my, my script and I'm looking at it and I'm, I'm filming that I'm shameless about it. I talk about it all the time. Yeah. That like, I believe like putting the effort in to actually like be intentional about the words that you use and all that stuff too, makes a big difference when it comes to hooks and content and all that stuff too. The other, the second thing I would say is that I've, I've spoken with a lot of people who feel that hooks are dirty. They mm. feel as though, like, I don't want to do all that. Like, you know, have try to be, you know, like clickbait or like say something crazy just to like pull someone in. And, and the way that I always, I've always looked at it is that, no, it's actually my goal at the end of the day is impact is service. I want to help people learn about sponsorships. And so if that means that I have to get through people's, the tough exterior that people have or the doubt 
the, the disbelief that they have around this. Yeah. If a hook is going to help me cut through that, I'm going to play that game all day long. And yeah. so for, for people who are, who are feeling as they're like, I don't want to play that game. I don't want to do, you know, the short form content, TikTok. I don't want to, I don't want to dance on the internet. Like, I don't want to do all that. It's like, come on, like get over yourself. Like if you want to have impact, like, this is what you have to do if that's the, if, if your audience is responding to that type of content, figure out creative ways to get through to them. And so yeah. I, I just think that like not taking yourself too serious. And that's the other thing, not taking, I just do not take myself seriously. Like I am like the most, um, like I'll, I'll be honest, like when I, when I started my content journey, I very much did feel like I needed to be professional and buttoned up and like, you know, talk a little bit more formally. If you go back and look at some of the earliest videos on my creator wizard channel, I'm like super formal and I'm like sitting there and like this type of thing. Right. And now I'm just like crazy. I'm like filming the B roll with my cats and yeah. like just being weird. And like, this, you know, I think people just resonate with just like yeah. being uniquely you. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah it, it adds as a, as a magnet, right. For the people that you really want to want to attract. And, you know, you, we obviously deal with a lot of people that are maybe at that uptight face in, you know, in their content creation might be the first time that actually in front of a camera, you know, we've have to mm. sit down with them a couple of times. Like, Hey, let's do this again. And let's do it this way. And, uh, you know, take a deep breath. Let's go walk. Like think about something nice and all these, these things, uh, like to get them through to be more them. Right. And I remember, uh, for us, that was very similar. And, and it got to a moment where we we're like the, our, we call it the screw it moment, you know, where we're like, screw it. You know what? It is what it is. You know, we, <laughs> the, we didn't do the hair. We have a hoodie. We'll jump in here. We'll do it. And that was like the moment where we unlocked consistency, right? Because it was, we just removed a ton of friction, mental friction, mental weight that we had. And we knew by, conquering consistency, then we can start getting better, right? Because you put in the reps and you do that. And obviously you've done it for, for many years, right? So now you have your style, you could, you know, for flow, you can jump on this interview and be like, Hey, let's talk about all this. Right. Uh, and, uh, but I, I'm with you, right? It's identifying those friction points in your own process and be like, okay, how can I remove it? So I can actually go and operate. You mentioned the teleprompter, right? That's yeah. a tool that maybe a lot mm -hmm. of people might be starting thinking. And I know that a lot of people are thinking, if I use a teleprompter, I do not know my topic enough. I'm like, it's not about that, right? It's about so many other things. It's like looking at your audience in the eye, right? It's about, I'm talking to them and not with somebody else. And what you mentioned, like slight, you know, a little bit lower. That, those are details that matter when you get to, you know, the level that, that you are at the moment. So I appreciate yeah. you being transparent I, with all this. I will say, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Justin. Yeah, no, I just wanted to add bookend that with one thing. I, you know, I, I got off stage. I was speaking at a conference recently and someone asked me, how do you seem so natural on stage? Like, how, like, how are you able to like, you know, tell these stories and like, just be very kind of on the fly. And it, it seems as though it's kind of supernatural mm -hmm. for you. And I, no one had ever asked me that before. And so I, I thought about it and I think the single, if there was a single piece of advice that I could give to anyone about being more natural on camera, um, was live stream. Mm -hmm. I, I've, I've been live streaming every single week for about three years now. And that is a very unique skill set where yeah. I don't have, I'm not like you guys where I don't have a like someone to talk to. Like I don't have a, <laughs> like a co-host. I feel the and same so, way, Justin. I, 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 yeah, wait, yeah. you don't use your cats as co-hosts? Wait, it's yeah. not that. I, well, you know what? That would be a good idea. I should put them in here when I do it. No, but it's like, I am, I am the only thing that I'm, I'm doing is interacting with the chat. Yeah. Right. And so there are times where no one's asking questions or like, I don't really know what to say for the next thing. And I just have to kind of get good at being like, Oh, and that reminds me, like, let me transition to this next topic. And so it's like, yeah, I've gotten okay. super good at just kind of thinking on the fly about how to like, that's how I was able to do, you know, this podcast where we didn't even have prep. I've never met you guys. We yeah. hopped on and we're like, we're having a great conversation because it's like, I'm able, because I've yes. been doing it every single yeah. week talking about this topic. Uh, I have so many things to talk about because of this repetitions that I put in, um, just kind of talking by myself in my bedroom, you know, for an hour every week, um, you know, or not, not my bedroom is an office, but you know, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. it, it, it might be the bedroom when the wife gets mad, but yeah, you know, Justin, uh, yeah. It, it's funny and funny that you mentioned that about the life, because before we actually started the podcast, we had a challenge called the 45 live and it came out from necessity, right? And at the same time we were kind of doing this, the 75 hard. So we're like, all right, how do we stay consistent 
And, you know, we got the inspiration from 75 Hard to, hey, let's do a challenge. And we created the 45 Live, which was go live for 45 days in a row. And it was internal. It was just me and Fonzie. Yeah, just the two like of us. Just us. And that actually kick-started a lot of things. It kick-started the podcast. It actually uh, led us to some great partnerships, right? Because there were some people that weren't commenting, but they were, you know, the silent watchers. And that turned into amazing partnerships and opportunities. And... When we decided to start the podcast, now that you mention it, the skill carry. Uh, we went on the podcast, yeah. and at first we were like, you know what? To stay consistent, we're gonna do the show live. Like we used to do the first like two hundred episodes, we were live every single time. That's why we have this animated intro, right? We might bring it back. Who knows? We might bring the the, the yeah. lives back. We're working on the logistics of but the studio right now. It's a great way, and you you, <laughs> yeah. you really made me consider: yeah. should we get all of our clients? to do the 45 <laughs> live challenge as soon as they sign mm. up. Because a lot of them is very difficult to get them in front of the camera and be, I don't want to say be themselves, but be comfortable, right? Just like be comfortable in front of the camera. Like we're having a conversation, they're extremely comfortable. And then as soon as we tell them, all right, we're about to start recording. And they see the five <laughs> second countdown on Riverside, <laughs> they stiffen up. They're like, mommies are like, what happened? They're, what is they're going like, on? They're like this. Yeah, yeah. This, is, this yep. is like this. It's right. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. And we're like, you are so extroverted. And as soon as this went on, like it all went out the window. You know what? What was a crazy experiment that we did once? Um, we were in Boise, Idaho and we were in this coffee shop and we decided that that trip that we were gonna vlog the experience, right? Or I decided that we're gonna vlog that experience. Fonzie yeah. was like, whatever, you do whatever you <laughs> wanna do. But we were running the show, I think it was like 300 plus episodes at the time, live, right, with the people coming in and out, the experience. And I remember the first, we, we were recording on a coffee shop and then we go to a gas station next door and we're gonna record the interaction inside of the gas station. You know, we have the camera in front of my face and I remember feeling the same way I felt before our first ever interview on the podcast. And in my head, I was like, we, we've done this like 400 plus times plus 45 like, but I'm in a public space with like people that I don't know with this camera in front of my face. And I remember starting to talk to the camera and then this manager came in like, you guys can be recording here. And we're like, I totally freaked out. And yeah. I, I, like, it I remember, uh, you know, we did an episode on this, on, on, on feeling that way. And it was a really great exercise to be like, wow, I identify now again, I, I went back to that place. And this is another skill that, that we have to develop at this point. And it was super interesting to go to that to that spot. And uh, do you know do you know Pat Flynn? Do you know who Pat Flynn is? I'm, I'm assuming. I do. Yeah. Okay. I've been on his podcast. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So yeah. Yeah. before, like, I knew him for the podcast Insider. We have some of his products, and and uh, well, I just recently discovered that he's an avid Pokemon card collector. Right. <laughs> yeah. I've been getting mm -hmm. into into Pokemon cards, but. Uh, <laughs> His live streams on Pokemon card, yep. like uh, opening the packs, is incredible. The way that he interacts with the right. with the with the chat, and it's not about the product and the thing. It was about the the whole experience that he's crafting for the audience. And by you saying that, was like, wow, what a great tool for people to start getting into this and putting on the reps. He's grabbing a hobby that he loves, and and then he's shifting his live stream on it. It's not a business live stream. It's like his passion mm -hmm. thing. So even if you right. are developing content for your business. What is something around the house, around things that you like that you can start live streaming about and getting those reps? Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think it's super interesting because you can always grab things from there and then apply into your business content. Yeah. You know, one, one thing I, I realized when I started educating people around sponsorship strategy was this idea around pitching and reaching out and talking with brands and stuff for me is second nature because mm. I've been doing it for so long. Yeah. But when I started educating people, I really forgot that. Mm -hmm. I really forgot that for most people, it's not second nature. And so when I was like, oh, just send the email to the brand and no, no big deal. Like I'll help you write the yeah. pitch and just hit send. And people will be like, oh, oh, I can't do that. I can't. What if yeah. they say no? What if they don't respond? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's been a, 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 an experience for me to um, work with a lot of creators who are at the earlier stages of their career and realize mm -hmm. that, no, actually the, getting the repetitions in at the beginning of realizing that yeah. like if a brand doesn't respond or says no to you, what I say, it's, it's not, no, it's not yet. Yeah. Yeah. That's always been my perspective. It's like, 
if a brand, unless a brand says, don't ever contact me again, I'm going to, I'm going to call the police. Like <laughs> you should always yeah. like that. That's a brand that you should be nurturing yeah. Yeah. because it may not be now that they're ready to collaborate with you, but in a year when their CEO decides that content is a priority and you happen to reach out again because they're in your, your monthly nurture, monthly or quarterly nurturing cycle, they're going to yeah. be like, oh, I'm so glad you emailed. You're, you're top of mind now because, you know, this is a priority for us right now. Yeah. I cannot tell you this is how it happens. Like when I tell people, when I sit them down and be like, the point of pitching is not to get a deal. Mm. The point is to get on their radar. Yeah. Yes. So that when they are ready to collaborate with you, you're top of mind. That is the whole point of pitching and, and having it be part of your regular routine as a creator business. Um, and people's minds are blown like, oh, wow. Like I was getting all like depressed when a brand would be like, no, we're not like we don't have a budget for this right now. And I'm like, that doesn't matter. Like you're now yeah. on their radar. Start emailing them every month, every quarter. Yeah. Believe me, in a year, in two years, <laughs> you're going to work with them. Believe me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. Show up at their office. Like, oh, you know, I just bought this extra coffee. You know, here you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We just got these uh, two dozen donuts randomly. <laughs> Damn. Look at that. You know, um, and by the way, click the link in the show notes if you want Lewis's course on stocking. Um, it's only uh, five ninety nine yeah. for, for Cyber Monday. Five ninety nine. <laughs> we'll make an even better offer for free. <laughs> Dude, Justin, oh, this has been absolutely amazing. I am curious before we have one last question that we ask every guest, but before that, I'm curious on your live streaming. What exactly do you do your live streaming on uh, about, and then on what platform do you do it? Um, well, it's a, it's a live stream all about male modeling. Uh, you know. makes sense. Um, makes sense. And yeah, you do it on yeah. your golden S speedo, right? I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Holding the cat. <laughs> sorry. Oh my God. I, I love podcasts like this. Where we can, we can, we can, um, uh, my live stream is all around, uh, sponsorships and, and brand deal negotiation. So I talk all about this very nerdy and very niche topic around, working with brands, collaborating. Yep. It's, it's very interactive people. Oh, right. I've got this brand in my inbox and I want to do this. Like, you know, what, what should I say to them? Like this everything. So I literally just answer people's questions for an, for an hour, basically around uh, brand deal strategy. Is but, that inside your, your community? I know you have a circle community or is that live on YouTube? Yeah, it's live on, I multi stream across every multi platform, right? YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, awesome. et cetera. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Cl clarifying. No golden speedo. <laughs> no, sure. I mean you can't really see. I told, I, you don't know what I'm wearing below. There we go. From the waist down. Yeah. I mean. No, no only fans <laughs> streaming. Oh, jeez. That's, That's awesome. awesome. I, I was asking Lee selfish, so I can go and join one of those. I would love to to catch yeah, one of those I lives. I would love for you guys to come on. It would be it would be awesome. Yeah, we'll be on the awesome. chat right there. Uh, yeah, Justin, please do. So last question we ask everyone. I. Usually we ask two, but the reason I'm not asking for the action points is because I think this episode is packed with action points, things that you guys can do to move one step closer towards getting that sponsorship for, you know, whatever medium it is that you guys are publishing on. But this question, it's, um, we love this question. Where would you be if you didn't publish ever? I think I would still be working in medical devices as an engineer. I, I don't think that I would be, and actually I would be, be there if it were not for my wife, if it were not for my wife having the courage to, to hit publish on her first YouTube video, because I learned a lot of, of uh, you know, what it takes to actually have the perseverance to, to create content from her. Um, and so I attribute a lot of my success to her. That's awesome. That's awesome. Th thanks for sharing. Hopefully that helps somebody that's about to hit publish, you know, to, to go actually publish it. Yeah. Uh, Justin, it's been an absolute pleasure, man. Thanks for coming on. Fonzie has been, t t you know, talking nonstop <laughs> about your tweets and things. And and uh, it's such an incredible resource, right? We're going to keep yep. this episode not only public, but also as a, as a reference for everybody that comes here into the studio that has that, that question. I mean, like, hey, this is what you need to, to consume, yep. learn a little bit more, you know, meet Justin and hopefully... Uh, this is a sort of really cool relationship, man. Yeah. Uh, so super honored yeah. to have you. Yeah. How can people connect 100%. and stay in touch with you? 
Yeah, sure. So um, probably the best way is my uh, weekly newsletter, creatorwizard.com slash join. Uh, probably the main reason you want to join is because I send you paid sponsorship opportunities for free on a silver platter. I'd be like, hey, these are brands that are currently actively trying to find creators to collaborate with. Um, and so so that it, it's actually a four times weekly newsletter. So I, my newsletter is like one of the biggest parts of my business. Actually, I love, you know, being able to send videos and podcasts and all yeah. sorts of stuff. I have my own podcast we didn't even talk about where it's called Creator Debates, yep. where every episode pits two high profile creators against each other. It's so good. A topic it's in the so creator good. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. So, so yeah, creatorwizard.com slash join is the best way to find out everything that's going on in my universe. Yeah. We're going to have to bring you back just to talk exclusive podcasting because I know you also have, uh, yeah. You started your podcast through uh, some sort of realization there with the ads loss and all that <laughs> stuff that I think is pretty interesting. But yeah. Justin, man, uh, thank you so much for coming. I want to encourage everybody, obviously, listening to join the newsletter. Incredible value. You're going to learn a lot from Justin. Follow him on YouTube, on Twitter. He is extremely active in all those platforms. Maybe you even want to check out his YouTube channel with his wife, right? April Justin TV. You're going to see him dress up as a Boy Scout, which is pretty, pretty cool. <laughs> let me tell you. I am an Eagle Scout. I am an Eagle, Eagle Scout. There you go. That, yeah, all these pe things that people don't know about me. Yeah, yeah. Let's go. That's, I know. That, that's that's awesome. what, that, that channel is where you go to learn the secrets. <laughs> well, I mean, that's I, I, under the Eagle Scout uh, uniform was the Golden Speedo. I mean, <laughs> it has to be there that's always. It has bring, to be bring there. In, bring in a bring <laughs> there. there we go. <laughs> Jesse, anything else you want to add before we head out? Um, yeah, if I could, if I could just give one parting note of encouragement, like I'm just gonna like cue the Rocky music or like the encouraging motivational soundtrack is just like, you can do this. Like sponsorships, I believe is for everyone. Like it doesn't matter how, what size you are, what niche you're in. Uh, it doesn't matter if you've never done it before. There exist brands and companies out there that you yeah. can capably serve and you can actually make a lot of money doing this. If you're thinking that, oh, how much could I really make $25 CPM on a podcast? No, no, no. It's not about CPM. It's not about, you know, this couple hundred bucks, this brand is like throwing your way. No, you can actually make, you know, my, like you mentioned at the top, my wife and I've made $4 million in sp sponsorships and, you yeah. know, in the last decade plus. And so like it, it can be a very, very huge and have a very huge impact on your, on your life and your business. So give it yeah. a shot. I love it. I That's love awesome. It. This episode has been full of what we call golden boulders, just Ooh. like golden nuggets, just way bigger. <laughs> that was absolutely amazing, Justin. <laughs> thank you so much. With that said, guys, thank you so much for tuning to the Contents Profit Podcast. Go ahead and follow the show in your favorite podcasting platform and on social media at Bizbros Co. That is Randy Justin here, help you move one step closer towards closing that sponsorship deal. Please make sure you share this episode and, and leave a five-star review. See ya. Bye, guys.